Um, if you'll join me in prayer, we'll offer this final talk uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ and to his church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the outpouring at Pentecost and the gift of the church. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your gift on Calvary and such love that sent you to the cross, willingly taking on the penalty, our penalty, out of love for us so that we too can be brought in and become divine partakers of the life of your Father. Sometimes we don't know how to share this depth of this gift that we've been given. Sometimes we just don't know how to say it, how to share it. We don't even know how to wrap our round, arms around it in order to be able to present it to another person. So we, right now, we, we offer that to you, our inability, our lack, what is lacking in us to be able to do this thing that is take something that is infinite, how can it be contained to be able to offer it to someone else? But you can do it, and we know it, because you've done it in each one of us. And so we join together in asking for the model, the great model of evangelization, your mother, to intercede for us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stories do amazing things in bringing people to the faith. I don't know if you know, um, if you're familiar with the journey home on EWTN, but that's what they do every week is they have a guest come in, and it's um, basically a sharing of how did you find the church? You weren't raised in it, um, or you didn't know what it was all about, and you grew up in it, and you walked away from it. How did you come to know what a treasure it was to come back to? The journey home is interesting because it, the guests on the journey home are, are frequently ministers. And that should, and there's been like 1,200 ministers who've come into the faith. Well, that doesn't seem like a large number. I want you to think about this. They were doing the only thing they were ever trained to do. The only way that they could make even a living at a professional level for a salary. And they walked away from that. And some of them bagged groceries because they had been trained for one thing and they had walked away from that one thing to be able to come into the church. That speaks to one thing and one thing only. They were following truth. They followed truth, and it led them into the church. So they loved Jesus Christ. They were pastors. They had parishes and denominations. But when they discovered, and there are so many stories, I can't even say all of them. They found, found God in so many different ways. But when they found him here, they left everything behind to be able to come in. And their stories are so profound that their stories became my way of putting pieces together. So I said that I had been watching Journey Home on the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16th. Um, and it was the summer before I started our CIA. And the lady I saw that summer is the one who wrote me, December. But I would watch every week 
And I continued to do that for years and years and years. And the reason why I did it was because I could listen to someone who had a background like me or came from a faith similar to mine, who had obstacles that I had had, talking about how they found the church and how they made the connections. And it was almost like they were taking my hand and leading me in, and their stories were incredible. I want you today to realize that your story does that for someone else. I mean, think about it. When you, when you think back to the apostles, they were communicating the Gospels. What are the Gospels? They're a story, a real story about the Messiah coming as he had been promised, fulfilling all of the prophecies to repair that bridge that we had damaged so that we could become, we could come into communion with God. So it's really important for you to treasure your story. Be willing to share your story. And we do that. But we do it with St. Monica's story, right? We do it with the saints' stories. You may even go and tell somebody my story. Hey, I heard this lady talk over the weekend, and this is what she said. Do that with your story. You have a story. Love what God has done. You don't love your story. It doesn't eclipse God. But you love, the, you love the God who gave you this incredible faith journey. Share it. Share you with someone else. Now, I'm going to start this last talk by talking about my husband, John. My little story. One of my little stories. My husband was raised Southern Baptist. And I don't know... Um, the Southern Baptists around here, but in the area where we live in, Southern Baptists um, frequently are very anti-Catholic. There's a real bias against Catholic teachings. My husband was um, raised by a father who was agnostic and a mother who was just die-hard Southern Baptist. And my husband loved his mother. Absolutely loved her. She was the golden or he was the golden child just loved him and then she got breast cancer and died when he was 13 and he still continued to try to go to church which is really hard when your father is agnostic and your older sister is kind of like not practicing the faith much at all she was 16 at the time and then it just became too hard well we live in St. Louis. The best schools in St. Louis are the Catholic schools. So his father is not stupid. He is agnostic, but he's not an idiot. And he's looking at the son who was 13 and like, what can I do to, to help this son who's just been through this trauma of losing his mother? And I think my father-in-law probably knew of himself. He'd done a inventory of himself, and he was not the kind of, let's talk about your feelings. No, they didn't talk about feelings. So he was trying to figure out, what can I help him have, because I don't know how to do it. I don't know the words to say, I don't know how to sit down and talk with him, or whatever. So, family, extended family, was Catholic. Some Catholics had married into the family, so there were some extended family that was Catholic, and they said, put him in a Catholic school. So that's what this agnostic father did. He put my husband in St. John Vianney High School in St. Louis. All the way through high school, my husband was like almost the only one who wasn't Catholic, so didn't go up and receive communion. And um, he went through all of high school just going to this high school, didn't convert, didn't really even ask questions about the faith. But it was a smaller school. It was really strong in academics, and it was an all-boys school, so he wasn't distracted. All those things, reasons why his dad was like, that's probably a smart thing to do. Fast forward many years later, he meets me. I am divorced. Marriage is annulled. I married right out of high school. I have three children from that first marriage. 
And I was in graduate school trying to get my life together. This is before I came into the church. So we meet in graduate school. And we fall in love. And he, which I still can't quite figure out why he did it, he marries a woman who has a whole lot of baggage with her. You know, Andrea, Stephen, and Carrie, my, <laughs> my three. And so overnight, he became um, a father. And their father wasn't really playing a role in their life. So he, at 29, came in and, and immediately was a father figure. Great. So then I get pregnant. Our daughter is born, Jennifer. And my dad dies, and I discover the Catholic Church. Had I been telling my husband these things? No. I had just been doing my own private reading and prayer time every day. I had a time, he was at work, it was middle of the morning, I would just have this prayer time. And one day, after I'd read St. Augustine's Confessions and St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul, I was reading St. Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle. And I put the book down beside me, and I'm like, I want what they had. That's the spirituality I want. I want that faith. I want that love for Christ. I want their prayer life. I want that. And then the next thought certainly didn't come from me. It came from the Holy Spirit. But to have any chance of having what they had, I'm going to have to belong to the faith home that gave birth to that spirituality. Denise, you're going to have to become Catholic. What? No, no. That was the first time it hit me that God was actually calling me into the church. Finally, I went to my husband and I told him, honey, I think, I think I'm supposed to become Catholic, my Southern Baptist husband. And I didn't know what he would say. But he said, okay, you have to go where you think God is calling you, but let me remind you of something. You said when your father stepped away from ministry, which he did when he became disabled, you said when he did that, that we could, as a family, identify with my faith, Southern Baptist. And we've been going to my mom's church. He didn't have mom in there, but that's what it was. It was literally the church his mother had gone to. You said we would identify as Southern Baptist as a family. That was the deal. Okay, I did. Okay. But what you're saying is, what I'm hearing you say is, it's okay for me to become Catholic. It's just as family, we're Southern Baptist. Okay, okay, I think I can do that. So I started going to RCIA, and I would go to Mass on Saturday night. And then on Sunday, I would go with him to his Southern Baptist mother's church, and we would all sit there. And it became complicated because most of our RCIA classes were on Sundays, and then I had to figure out how to make that work. And I had to, so it was a whole mess, but I'm like, well, I did. I promised. And I can't force them to become Catholic, but I know where God is calling me. A couple of years after I became Catholic, we were actually on our way back from church on Sunday morning at his Baptist church. And he said, um, I think you should get Jennifer in PSR, it's Parish School of Religion, it's like CCD classes, I don't know what you call them here, but it's what your parish has when your child is not in a Catholic school so that they can be catechized. Let me say that again, because I think I, that was too many words, you missed it. My Southern Baptist husband is driving home from Southern Baptist Church service on Sunday morning and says, I think you should get our daughter in PSR. What? Of course, I'm like, I don't care what his reason is. I'm doing it. That's great. And, but the, I'm like, why? And he said, well, I grew up in St. Louis. And I went to a Catholic high school. And I know what it's like to be the only one that can't receive communion. And that's not fun. And if she's going to go to one of the best schools, it's going to be a Catholic school. And I don't want her to feel like I did. So that was his reason. I don't really care what the reason was. That's grace. So I went to the church office, and I said, I want to get my daughter in. So that's how my youngest 
became Catholic. And she is all in, baby. She's all in Catholic. This kid, I praise God because she has never had to, do I believe in the Immaculate Conception or don't I? No, she grew up with it like you, just like it makes perfect sense to her because she didn't have the baggage put into the back of her head. And it makes sense if you didn't receive baggage that make, makes it seem silly to you. So, but what about my husband? Well, Jennifer and I would start going to Mass. I mean, we, we went to Mass, and he would be left home alone because by then the older three had left home. And he would start coming with us to Mass just so he wasn't all by himself. And because now she had become Catholic, in order for us to drive the hour in like 10 minutes to get to this church that's the Southern Baptist Church he wanted to go to, seriously, hour and 10 minutes from our new house to get to the church he wanted to go to, that seems kind of crazy to me. When you pass up lots of different churches and lots of different denominations, but that's the one he wanted to go to. Now it seems silly because he would be the only one driving. So what had effectively ha happened is he stopped going to church. This was his next phase. Then, this one's the funny phase. Then he decided, well, I'm not going to become Catholic, but I have to go somewhere to church. So then he decided to go to the Lutheran church in our town. Now, we live in a teeny tiny town, and the Lutheran church is about a tenth the size of our parish. So he would pass our parish to go to the little teeny tiny Lutheran church just so he wouldn't go to the Catholic church that his wife and daughter were going to. And he did that a few times, and then he finally, and the, and the minister was calling because he wasn't coming. I'm like, your minister's calling, and you're not, it's like, yeah, I think it's kind of silly for me to do that. I'm like, I think so too, but I didn't tell him that. So he just started kind of coming with us, even though he wasn't Catholic. Summer of 2006, I am so in love with this faith. I came in in 2005. This is, no, it's summer 2007, two years after I came into faith, talking with him about the faith. And every time I talk to him, why is it when we do that, it always goes to Mary? And when it goes to Mary, it always gets really uncomfortable when you're talking with Protestants. And it makes me really sad that it's like that, but it is. And every time we talk about Mary, this husband and I, who are on the same page with almost everything, we're on the same page politically, we're on the same page morally, we're on the same page, I mean, everything, the way you raise kids, we agree across the board. When you hit Mary, argument. I remember this one day clearly, that summer where I'm trying to talk about Mary and my husband who is very strong voice and authority says to me and I can't say it the way he did it because I can't do it but he said I'm never going to become Catholic and you need to just get over it only he said it more angrily than that and this is everything to me not, don't get me wrong, I don't mean Mary is all it is, but Mary is the mother of my Lord. Her yes means everything to what our faith means to us. She gave us the son. Her faith, she is our, our greatest boast in humanity, right? She is our greatest boast as humankind. And I couldn't do her justice. I couldn't explain it. So I started, that was about August of that year, I started praying for him rather than arguing with him. Beginning of August, time to go to confession. I go into confession. I'm really discouraged. I can tell you what my confession is. The priest can't tell you what I confess, but I can tell you. Um, and I won't tell you everything, but I'll tell you just a little, just a little part. Um, I'm discouraged. I think I'm even maybe even despairing because this is what happened. 
He got angry. I got angry. I went into the bedroom. I cried. It's, I just don't think it'll ever happen. And I'm just at a loss. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And I'm not making this up. It was the Feast of St. Monica. And I'm in the confessional before Mass. And he says to me, pray for him. As St. Monica was faithful to pray for her son, St. Augustine, pray for him. And then he said, would we ever have a St. Augustine without her? And then he said something, and I don't know if I really believe this. He said, would she have had her path to uh, salvation and sanctification without having a son that she needed to pray for, to just be fervent and faithful? I personally believe God is God, so he would have made her another path if she hadn't had the son, Augustine, but I'll go with it. And I, on that Sunday was when I determined to pray for him, to intercede for him as she did for her son. He was going with us to Mass Christmas Eve that year. It's only, what, like five months later? Christmas Eve, he goes with us to Mass. I don't think anything of it because you're with your family. And now our daughter and I are both Catholic. So we go in, I genuflect, I go in and I kneel and I pray. Our daughter genuflects, she goes in and she kneels and she prays. She's like six or seven at that time. And then I sit down. And we're there early because that's what you do on Christmas Eve or you don't have a place to sit because all of the people who don't go during other times of the year are always there on Christmas Eve. And so we're sitting and waiting so that we would have seats. And my husband leans over to me and he says, so what do you pray about when, when you pray after you do that thing you do? And um, I did not want to have an argument on Christmas Eve. So I said, oh, you know, I pray about everything, you know, just all this stuff. And he says a second time, no, what do you pray about when you kneel there and pray? And I really did not want to have an argument. So again, I said, I pray for stuff. I pray for you. I pray for the kids. I pray for this stuff, you know. He said it a third time. No, what do you pray about when you kneel there and pray? I'm like, buddy, if you ask me three times, I'm going to tell you what I pray about, whether or not we're going to have an argument right here on Christmas Eve in the middle, well, before church, but before Mass. But I'm going to tell you. I didn't say that, but I'm like, okay, let him have it. I pray that one day you will know that the Eucharist is really Jesus Christ. And that someday we can receive him together. And he reached into his suit coat and he pulled out a Christmas card and he handed it to me. And I opened it up. And there was handwriting in it and I read the part that he had handwritten. And he said, I, I used to just love you so much that wherever you went, there was no hill or mountain too high to climb to follow you. I would follow you anywhere. So I've had to ask myself, do I still love you that much? Yes, I do. No, I love you more than I did then. So I will be coming into the church this Easter vigil. So then I'm crying as I'm reading it, just like I'm crying now. But um, I turned to him. What are you going to say on Christmas Eve? First of all, I'm like blown away and I'm crying because this is the miracle I'd waited for, right? The one who'd never become Catholic. Um, but this is what I said to him. I turned to him and I said, I just don't think we can get you in that fast. It's December. It's like, it's like I, I, I get, we'll have to call Sean. We have to see if we can get you an RCIA. I think they've already had. This is what my husband said to me. Oh, honey, I've been privately studying with him for months. Really, when did you start? In August. Do like St. Monica did, Denise. 
pray for him just as she prayed for her son. Feast of St. Monica, early August. And he started, he called the office and he said, okay, here's the deal. I want to have private study. I want to study the faith. Do not tell my wife. If you tell my wife that I'm doing this, I quit. And I will keep doing, taking it until I hit an obstacle I cannot overcome. And if I hit an obstacle that I don't agree with, I can't overcome, I quit. But if I don't, and I keep going, and you haven't told her, then I'll come into the church. So he told me that. After Christmas Eve, I went to the RCIA leader, and I said, really? Really? How many times every week am I in this office? How many times have you asked me, how you doing, Denise? And I say, I don't know. Good, bad. How do I even know what I am? And you knew. How, I said, I even asked you, how many do you have in RCIA this year? And you said, one. We only have one. It's my husband. And you couldn't tell me no, because then she, he would have quit. That's just a great RCIA leader right there is what that is. But my husband came to the church. Now, I asked him later, why did you do that? I mean, apart from you wanted to follow me. But my husband, you got to understand, is a stubborn, stubborn man. He would not follow me into doing something dumb. Okay? So if he didn't think it was true, he wouldn't have done it. But I'm like, what, what was it? My husband was in his Ph.D. program at St. Louis University, SLU, at the time. And, and he said, well, okay, this is what I was thinking. I show up to my doctoral classes all the time. And I know, and I trust, that these professors have been vetted by the university to teach me my classes in public policy. And I trust that the, the school has vetted them. I trust that the degrees they have mean something. And so I sit and submit to listening to them. And so, I don't know, it just kind of dawned on me that why wouldn't you at least show up and sit and listen to the teachings of a church, I don't know, where saints have been vetted for 2,000 years. Maybe that might be a smart thing to do. So that's what I did. We'd go about things in a totally different way. But that is to show you that I read my way into the book, or into the church, reading books, saints, and stuff. He just, it took, it took, took us having trouble talking about the faith, and then also him just intellectualizing it. So the people that you're praying for, they have a key. I don't know what the key is, but God does. And he's placed you in their life, and you're going to be part of it. Okay, you are part of it. You just have to be able to, to show up and do not get too despairing or too discouraged. Go to confession if you're starting to feel that way. So my husband came into the church. We need to be willing to offer things up for those that we are interceding for. And I want to talk for a moment about St. Monica. St. Monica is a saint. She was very holy. But she had something that she did that gave her a little bit of comfort. And she gave that little bit of comfort completely up. I want you, while I'm telling you the story of what that comfort was, I want you to think about something you may have, maybe a sorrow or suffering or something that's your little bit of comfort that you could give up and have it be an offering that you offer up for this one or these people that you are going to be praying for during these nine days. St. Monica liked a little wine now and then. I don't know if you've read her story or not, but she's the patron saint of alcoholics. She's also the patron saint of, I'm trying to think of what some of the other stuff is. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, not because she was an alcoholic, but she liked a little bit of wine. She's a patron saint for alcoholics because she gave that up, that little piece of comfort in her life that was full of uncomfortable stuff for her son 
and to not have anything blocking her from just letting it all go. What do you have that is a little bit of comfort that you could? I'm not saying you have to do it all the time. I'm not even saying you have to do it for 40 days of Lent, although when we get to Lent, that's a really good time for you to lay that thing down. What can you give up now and then? What sorrow or suffering that your mind goes to too often probably, can you, when that hits you, you instead turn it into a prayer for this person? You know, we're told to pray without ceasing, aren't we? How do you do that when you got to live a life, right? How do, you, how do you pray without ceasing when you actually have to live? Well, if you deal with chronic suffering, if you turn that chronic suffering into a prayer, you're now praying without ceasing, okay? If you have something that hurts your heart, somebody's hurt you, there's something, there's an agony or a loss that you've had, and that hits you a lot, when you turn that into a prayer, when it comes and hits your heart, you're now praying without ceasing. So these are some ways that you can do that. I'm telling you, if you do that, that prayer is a continually being raised offerings like incense going up to heaven. We're told in the Old Testament that our prayers go up to heaven like the incense. That becomes an efficacious prayer for the one or the ones that you're praying for. She gave up her little bit of comfort in a life where there was probably nothing else that was comforting, except for God. But that was enough. I'd like to talk about a spirit of wonder and awe. It's one of the, one of the gifts that I talk about in the book that so many of you have purchased. And it probably was my favorite chapter to write. Catholics get this. We know that amazing things happen. Amazing things happen that we can't really explain. Waters parts. Lions' mouths are closed so they don't eat Daniel in the lion's den. The walls of Jericho fall. But we know even in church history, amazing things have happened. We believe in signs and wonders, and we stand by with wonder and awe, which is why we also can say we believe. We believe that our Lord comes to us, literally, truly comes to us, body, blood, and soul, and divinity right here. By the way, if the people in your life don't know what's happening here, this is the source and summit of our faith. That's lesson number one. How can you receive Jesus Christ and have this tremendous treasure, the greatest treasure of your life? You have access, and I'm going to be really hard on you because I was not raised Catholic. How could I possibly go 40 years and not know this? How could I teach in a Catholic school and not know this? Somebody dropped the ball. The high school I went to, almost everyone in my high school was Catholic. And yet, somehow I got to at the age of 40, and I didn't know that Catholics believe that Jesus is really coming to them. That it is not symbolic. It is real. It is true. It is Christ, the one I love. Had I known that, I would have said, i got to figure out why you believe that, because I love him. And there's just no way that's happening. I've got to figure out why you believe that. Oh, really, it's John 6. Really, it's in the Bible that's biblical? That would be the first thing as a Protestant I would have said. It's in there. You have to either say, I don't believe what Jesus says. Or you have to say, oh, he meant something else when he said that. But let me tell you, when a Protestant looks at that, they have to wrestle with this. Why do I take some passages literally and others not? And who, who am I to decide that that's literal or it's not? The church has always believed it's true, literally. I give you my flesh. 
unless you eat my body and drink my blood, there can be no life in you. Amen, amen, I say to you. He says it, amen, amen, twice because he's doubling down on it. And most of them left. The thousands that had followed him because they he gave them food to eat, they leave, and the only ones who remain are the 12. That's where it all shook down right there. That was the shakedown, the teaching on the Eucharist. And he turns to Peter, or Peter turns to him, and Jesus says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says, this is a difficult teaching. Yeah, it is. But Peter himself says, but you have the words of eternal life. Where can we go? Where else can we go? Amen. So back to this. If this is not your primary catechesis to the person you're praying for, it needs to be. And it needs to be with your life. Why are you not? Here's another thing. I love Jesus so much. I just just have loved him since I was a little kid. Denise, really? Do you really? Because if you found out he came, to you every day here at 8 o'clock in the morning, would you get out of bed to go to Mass? Or would you be too tired? Do you really love him that much? I mean, we all wrestle with this. And one of the beautiful things about being Catholic is you can't just say it as pie-in-the-sky stuff. I love Jesus. Oh, really? How much do you love him? He's willing to come to you every day. And you aren't required to come every day. The church only asks for you to come on Sundays. Right? But do you love him? Because if you really, really do, and you really believe this, you show up as much as you... And I'm saying this because it's like, Denise, what's wrong with you? Why would you ever miss daily Mass? This is the number one thing. If they enter eternity and they stand before God and they say, no one ever told me that, and you had a chance, that's on you. So, number one thing, evangelizers, if you're given an opportunity, don't let it pass you by. Let them know we are have Jesus in the Eucharist anytime you want him. And he loves you so much, he wants to come inside of you. I'm sorry if I got tough on you, but it is, if, if I leave without saying that, it's the source and summit of our faith. Our faith tells us that. I I'm held accountable for not telling you that. St. Augustine talks of his mother who was filled with the spirit of wonder and awe. And in his book, Confessions, this is what he writes after her death. And God, you sent your hand from above and drew, drew my soul out of that profound darkness. Reminds us of Psalms 40, right? Lift us, lift us up out of the miry clay, put us on solid rock. My mother, your faithful one, had been weeping to you for me. More than mothers weep at the physical deaths of their children. She discerned the death in which I lay because she had the faith and spirit that you give. And you heard her, O oh Lord. You heard and did not despise her tears. Those tears streamed down, watering the soul under her eyes in every place where she prayed. Oh, yes, you heard her. She'd had a vision that he would convert. And so he writes, the vision by which you comforted her, in a vision she saw herself standing on a carpenter's rule of wood, in anguish and overwhelmed with grief, a shining youth came toward her, cheerful and smiling, because he wanted to instruct her, for he did not need to be told. And he asked, why? Why are you crying every day in such grief? And she answered that she was bemoaning my lost condition. And in this vision, he told her to stop and be content 
and to look around and notice that I was with her. She looked around and saw me standing by her on the very same rule. What was this but you, God, inclining to her heart? For you see, God had given her a vision, a grace, that this thing that she had cried and interceded for, that God was listening, God was hearing, and he was working all things to a good and holy ending. Do you trust that he's doing that in your situation? Amen. Do you believe that the tears that you cry are tears that are watering seeds you've planted? St. Monica is taking you by the hand. And she's saying, I gave up my life. And I gave it up for my husband and my son. I sacrifice big and little. Little, glass of wine. Big, chasing a son to the ends of the earth. I gave up the comforts of home. What will you give up? We live in a country that does not like to pick up crosses, does not like to give up things. We avoid sorrow. We hedge our bets. We avoid hurts and losses, and we resent every offense. She just doesn't. She just didn't. Mary gave, or Monica gave of her whole self, even to the end of her life, for the conversion of her son. I know I mentioned my daughter, Carrie. I'm just going to quickly tell you. I went in to see the priest. I do this a lot. Um, but it, it, every time, every time, it has yielded a conversion. Every time I did it. So I went to the priest. My daughter was moving back home with us with her two children. This is when she only had two not married, to move into our house. I'm not the most patient woman in the world. Anyway, so I went to the priest, and I'm like, I'm not the most patient woman in the world, and my daughter's moving back, and probably the reason she went away at 18 and didn't want to come back and, and, and has gone into this life is because I wasn't, you know, soft, gentle mama. I was like, you need to do this, and what did you do that for? And now she's bringing two infants, a one-year-old and a newborn, I could possibly chase her as far away from the church so that this kid never has a chance to come back. I don't want to do that. This may be my only chance, only chance for this kid and my grandkids. And he said, do you have a, do you have a pocket cross? Do you have a cross crucifix the size that you can put in your pocket? I'm like, I don't. We have them on the walls, and I have a rosary. It's like, I want you to get a pocket-sized crucifix. And not to show her, look at what I have. Shh. Not for that. Don't want her to even know you have it. I want you to have it, though, and I want you to carry it around in your pocket. And every time you feel like you're about to lose it with her or your grandkids, I want you to reach in your pocket, and I want you to hold it. Hold it as tight as you need to, even if you get the imprint in your hand. That's okay. And I did that took a few years, but my daughter came into the church, and my, as I said earlier, my five grandsons are being raised, that was a battery, um, are being raised in the church. Thanks be to God. I want to close with this. St. Augustine's words about his mother fill us with hope, and if there is one thing you need more than anything else right now, it's hope. Nobody shows up to something on a Saturday, unless they're looking for a little bit of hope at church, unless they're looking for a little bit of hope. I mean, there are lots of things you could have done with this gorgeous day. You came because people were on your heart, and you needed some hope. And we're going to just listen to these words of St. Augustine and let them fill you with hope. And this is what we're going to close out with before we go to the most important thing we do today, unless you've been to Mass, and that is adoration. St. Augustine writes, Your words are true. 
and you have promised mercy unto the merciful, which you give us grace to be. You will have mercy on whom you will have mercy and will feel compassion on whom you will have compassion. My mother only asked that her name might be commemorated at your altar. Is it not commemorated right now? Which she had served without a break of one day. She knew that holy sacrifice, this one that takes place right here, that would be dispensed by which the handwriting that was against us all is blotted out. She had triumphed over the enemy. May these words be words that those we leave behind can say of us, those we intercede for today. Let it be. We pray for the intercession for those you have brought today through the intercession of St. Monica. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.